oh, well, these people came down here to start trouble. Caller, thank I know you. Very and that was our last call this morning on the topic on if pro protesting affects policy. Joining us on the phone right now is Kathleen Coakley. She is the Vice President of Exhibition Development for the International Spy Museum. Good morning. Good morning. Tell us about the main purpose of this site. Of the website. Yes. The website now, if you go to, excuse me, uh, spymuseum.org, is really up as a media site to uh, allow members of the press to uh, get the very basic information and, and quite a bit of detail about what this museum will be. For the general visitor who goes, uh, he or she will get the same information. Everything from what the topics are within the museum to what kinds of objects we display, where we are, and uh, located in Washington, and what will be available in July, opening on July 19th this summer. What led to the creation of this museum? Well, a great need. There is no museum uh, dedicated to espionage. Washington is the spy city of the world. And now, even more than before, I think people need to understand the absolute uh, mandate for any nation to gather as much intelligence about the world of, with, within which we all operate. And when you said July 19th, how many floors of the museum are going to exist and what kind of displays will you be able to see there? You will be able to see um, on three floors of the museum exhibits that are roughly divided into two parts. The first part gives you an introduction to the world of espionage, and that is allowing you to put yourself in the shoes of someone who is a spy or who could be a spy to understand the training, the expertise, the skills, and all the gadgets and technology that a spy would use uh, in no matter what country or almost no matter what time period. And then after you've gotten that orientation, you move back throughout history and see how, how spies operated. You see the um, world-changing events that have taken place because of espionage and intelligence gathering that went on, everything from battles to whole movements to people who you wouldn't expect to have been spies who did operate under the cover of another career and were able to do incredible things. You would think spies, you think things like gadgets and the equipment they would use. Will there be an element of that included in your exhibit? Absolutely. This is, you know, I think most of us know about these gadgets from, from seeing them in, in films and TV. And the truth is it's hard to know which came first, the chicken or the egg. We know from our advisors that many of the intelligence agencies paid very careful attention to the things that came out of pop culture because many of the ideas weren't so far off the mark and vice versa. So you'll see the things that, I mean, everything from a lipstick gun that you could carry in your purse, and one of the ones we have it was based on one found at the uh, West German border, to uh, really amazing technology for its time. Uh, due to the needs of breaking codes in the Second World War, uh, the very precursors to the computers were developed to be able to break codes on a daily basis and intercept uh, Nazi Air Force and Naval signals. Is this museum federally funded in any way? No, it isn't. It's privately funded. We were very lucky in Washington to get the first um, tax increment financing from the D.C. government. That was a real coup, but we are a uh, private museum that um, will be able to then, in the district's view, be able to give back. We're not competing for philanthropic funds in that area. And just before we go, give your website address, please. It is spymuseum.org. And that is Kathleen Coakley. She's the vice president of the exhibition development for the International Spy Museum. We appreciate your time with us. Thank you very much. We've been, for the last few weeks on Saturdays, taking a look at the history of U.S. intelligence and counterintelligence. Joining us now from Boston is Peter Gross. He is the author of Gentleman Spy. He also wrote this book, Operation Rollback, America's Secret War Behind the or Iron Curtain. And he joins us today to talk about the life and influence of Alan Dulles. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. <laughs> Our first question is, what was Alan Dulles's contribution or biggest contribution to the U.S. Intelligence Service? Well, Alan Dulles is surely one of the most enigmatic and conflicted personalities of the American 20th century. He was, as the biography I wrote, calls him very much a gentleman, a 19th century figure. 
Yet he was the inspiration of an American intelligence establishment, a, a, an arm of government which was officially sanctioned to do things which could not be officially acknowledged. He was not the first, he was not the founder of the CIA, but he was its inspiration and longtime director. And how directly did he inspire it, as you say? Alan Dulles started life as a diplomat, but he, had, he was intrigued by the things that could be done uh, under the guise of diplomacy uh, to influence, to promote, to encourage trends in foreign policy secretly. He believed that not everything had to be out in the open and that often things could be done much more usefully without public acknowledgement. This was a, uh, we take this kind of for granted today, but at the, in the 1940s, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it was not at all taken for granted. It was a, uh, a radical notion with effects that some would say have been benign and others, probably many more, would say have been destructive to the American role uh, through the 20th century. When, we can argue about that. Well, how old was Alan Dulles when he became director of the CIA? I'm sorry, how? How old was he? He was in early middle age. He was born in uh, 1893, so he would have been in his 50s. Uh, already a distinguished public figure uh, in, in government, in the law, the Wall Street law. Uh, he, was, he was a renowned commentator and thinker on American foreign policy. He also, uh, although we didn't know it at the time, he also was one of the most successful uh, American intelligence operators during World War II in penetrating Nazi Germany through his net, the network of agents which he set up from his base in neutral Switzerland. We learned about that after the war. Obviously, we didn't know it during the war. He was a true professional in the game of intelligence, uh, intelligence operations, at a time when uh, there weren't any professionals except for him. And we are going to be talking about Alan Dulles as we continue our look at the history of U.S. intelligence. If you'd like to chime in and offer some comments and ask Peter Gross a question about Alan Dulles, you can call on one of four lines on your screen, 202-585-3880 for Republicans. 202-585-3881 for Democrats and for all others 202-585-3882. We also have a special line set aside for members of the intelligence community. It's 202-585-3883. At the beginning of his intelligence career, what was Alan Dulles's first mission? As a young diplomat, his first assignment was to the United States Embassy in Vienna in uh, 1916. World War I was going on, he was the junior third secretary, and shortly after he arrived, this is what makes him such a colorful figure, shortly after he arrived the Habsburg Emperor Franz Josef died. And here was this young diplomat who represented the United States at the funeral of the great Habsburg Emperor. That was his first mission, that's how his uh, uh, career began. That's the bookend at the beginning, the funeral of the Emperor Franz Josef. The other bookend at the end of his career, you haven't asked me this yet, but it completes the picture of Alan Dulles. He served on the Warren Commission investigating the assassination of John F. Kennedy. From the Emperor Franz Josef to John F. Kennedy, that was the career of Alan Dulles. And how long did he serve as CIA director? He was CIA director through most of, uh, throughout the Eisenhower administration and into the first uh, year of the Kennedy administration. He was uh, DCI from 1953 to 1961, a very long time for a uh, head of central intelligence. Our first question this morning is on our line for Democrats. Good morning. Go ahead. Are you there? Yes. What's your question for Mr. Gross, sir? Uh, Mr. Gross, um, I'm just curious as to why, after a spy is caught, an American spy is caught, why is he, after he's debriefed, why, why do we keep him alive? They cost Americans so many problems. I was just curious as to why they're not shot like they are in Russia. 
I'm sorry, I, you mean when the United States captures a uh, spy, a person who has been caught in espionage, uh, why they're not shot right away? Well, if the, the issue is the United States is not the Soviet Union, and we do have the rule of law, and in espionage cases, it's never as clear cut as you make it sound. Uh, the United States has executed spies starting, I mean, uh, we can go back to the, to the story of Nathan Hale, uh, who wasn't, it, it was, he wasn't spying for the United States. But uh, there have been executions, but there have also been uh, 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 legal procedures. And frequently, you say, after they've been debriefed, uh, frequently the debriefing has to go on for many, many years because the, the espionage agent can continue to supply interesting tidbits and useful information. A member of the intelligence community is next from Vienna, Virginia. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'm a former Marine uh, signal intelligence analyst, and uh, I was in a radio reconnaissance unit in, uh, in Hawaii, and, and we used to deploy into the South Pacific and, and do things down there. And I was just wondering, uh, the intelligence community in general, uh, do they go about rec recruiting uh, spies um, from the military units, or do they get them from the civilian world mostly? How does that work? Well, uh, first of all, they don't recruit spies. Uh, spy is a very loose word covering a multitude of sins or virtues, depending on where you are. Uh, the, the preferred word is agents, uh, undercover agents, agents serving uh, under diplomatic, business, educational cover careers. Recruitment by the CIA is done uh, not only in the military services, in fact rather less likely in the military services because the military has its own intelligence uh, uh, branches and missions which are quite often quite different from the CIA. They're recruited among the population at large, among young people, men and women, who are uh, interested in some kind of public service, who don't know probably when they go into the agency whether they're going to be uh, a public overt analyst uh, or whether they're going to operate under some kind of cover, which takes many years to build up. Uh, you don't apply for a job as a spy and, and uh, uh, you find yourself acting as an undercover agent only after a long period of preparation. When Mr. Dulles became the head of the CIA, what are some of the first things he did to establish his own tone in the department? What are the things that he saw that maybe needed to, to be improved on? Well, even before he became head of the CIA, he uh, strongly influenced this new novel organization uh, for, for secret intelligence. He knew how to set up networks of agents, the, 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 the complicated filigree of contacts and missions, many of which uh, individually seemed petty, but when put together by the man at the top, uh, it was only men at the top in those days, uh, um, uh, add up to a picture of, of information secretly acquired which can be of use to policymakers. Alan Dulles knew how to do this. He was one of the few American public figures or private figures who knew how to do this. And so he had a, a strong influence on the procedures for acquiring secret information. That's how, that, remember, the United States was still smarting under the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. And we, uh, the, 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 the national leadership, Democrat, Republican, whatever, uh, didn't want to be caught red-handed like that again. So how do you avoid uh, that kind of surprise attack? Well, you, you find ways of getting information. And who knew better than Alan Dulles how to do that? Our next call is on our line for others from Somerset, New Jersey. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I heard you mention uh, that Mr. Dulles served under the Eisenhower administration, uh, being somewhat of a person into history. I, I believe the Eisenhower administration, during the Eisenhower administration, the CIA was one of the most embarrassing things America had to offer, considering what he did to Fidel Castro, who was quoting Thomas Jefferson until Mr. Dulles, the CIA, 
thought about invading Cuba and tried to do it and push Castro to Russia. Uh, I believe you were involved in the Philippines where a democratically elected president was overthrown. That country is still smarting from that effort uh, to this day. And I also believe the CIA had a lot to do with Patrice Lumumba, and we know that country is still smarting and still on its knees as a result of someone that you're giving a whole lot of accolades to, and I, I just don't see uh, where he deserves it. That's a very fair commentary. The, and by accolades, I'm, uh, I'm talking about him as a professional of intelligence. Under his leadership, uh, the United States government suffered many embarrassments. The one perhaps most striking, which you did not mention, was the, uh, the shooting down of a U-2 spy plane, which uh, President Eisenhower uh, stood up before the world and denied. Uh, a few days later, the President of the United States was shown and uh, revealed in an outright lie. This was the fault of the CIA. This was under Alan Dulles's leadership. Uh, the, you could have mentioned the CIA operations in Iran in 1953, the overthrow of uh, Mossadegh, uh, with implications that we still are suffering through. The, uh, uh, an attempted coup in Guatemala in 1954, uh, throwing out the legally elected president, Arbenz. Uh, again, the implications of CIA meddling in, in uh, third world countries still continues. The Bay of Pig operations, not under Eisenhower incidentally, but under John Kennedy, was definitely uh, on the watch of Alan Dulles, and he uh, stepped down shortly thereafter. It was an American disaster. It was an American, it was a CIA disaster. Uh, the record is by no means uh, uh, pure and, and clean. How was he perceived as a leader? The, the most, the hardest thing, when I was writing his biography, the hardest thing about Alan Dulles was to convey uh, the complex nature of his character and his personality. Uh, enigmatic, uh, secretive in what he was doing. Uh, he was one of the most colorful and genial uh, people of his time. Uh, remember, Alan Dulles was the younger brother. There was the older brother, John Foster Dulles, who was much more famous, uh, a towering stature in his day. He was the Secretary of State, all-powerful Secretary of State for Eisenhower. He was a very austere and uh, distant figure, not particularly uh, beloved uh, by the public at large. Alan Dulles, the younger brother, he was cheerful, genial, always ready with quips and colorful comments. Uh, uh, one of the people who I had discussed his uh, biography with as I was writing it summed up the two brothers. John Foster Dulles, many people who agreed with him still didn't like him. Alan Dulles, most people who didn't agree with him could not help but like him. So, as a leader, there is no doubt that he gen uh, generated immense loyalty, which still exists within the intelligence community. A member of the intelligence community calling in from Quaker Pen Quakertown, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, go ahead. Hello? Sir, are you there? Go ahead. We've lost him. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Denver, Colorado is next on our line for Republicans. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Uh, I look forward to uh, purchasing Mr. Grouse's book today, as a matter of fact. It sounds very interesting. Uh, let me just uh, ask him a few questions. I, I realize uh, a good spy like a, uh, a wise internist doesn't ever tell all he knows. But uh, I thought uh, Vienna was the spy capital of the world, uh, or is that just a throwback to the uh, Second World War. And secondly, uh, since I have you on the line, it, wouldn't it be nice if the intelligence communi community could figure some way of uh, identifying cars, the stolen cars, take, and of course this is a detail that probably most people aren't terribly interested in, but th so that the car could be identified as it crossed the border back into Mexico when they were, when they were stolen. And that could be a satellite project. But uh, anyway, I uh, 
look forward to uh, hearing your discussion, and uh, thanks very much. Well, thank you for those comments. Uh, there are probably a lot of cities around the world which would vie for the title of spy capital of the world, uh, either vie for it or run away from it. Lisbon, uh, Bern, Switzerland, Berlin. Uh, as, the, as world politics have changed, so have the, the places where intelligence agents meet and, and uh, uh, do their dirty tricks. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the techniques of acquiring information change with, uh, with the times, with the sorts of information that are, are required. Some things now can be done by electronic eavesdropping, by uh, satellite uh, photographs or other sensing devices. Uh, there's still a lot of things, however, the intentions of people which cannot be discerned electronically and it is necessary to have human contacts. The, the, the human agent, which is what Alan Dulles knew in World War II, uh, remains a vital figure in intelligence. St. Thomas Virgin Island is next. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning uh, uh, to you and to your uh, guest. Um, I attended uh, Pennsylvania State University in the mid-50s. Before um, Alan Dulles became director of CIA, was he not in a position of leadership, president of the university there, or had some association with the Pennsylvania State University in the 50s? Mr. Gross? Hello? Excuse me, yes. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, his career was never in academia. Uh, he was a Wall Street lawyer. He was a partner in the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell after he stopped, after he resigned from the American Foreign Service. He was a, a pillar of the American legal establishment and a leader of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, he did not have any academic career, though he was widely respected in academic circles. When he took head of the CIA, you talked about some of the low points of the, 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 the organization under his leadership. What were some of the high points? You know, anything I say, uh, I'm going to be jumped on. Uh, because what uh, one man's high point is another man's low point. I think it would have to be said that the the lasting legacy of Alan Dulles uh, beyond any specific uh, operation was the creation of a responsible, more or less, depending on the time and the circumstances, government agency where none existed before, a, uh, an organization responsible to the political leadership, it never went. It never went off on its own like a rogue elephant uh, for very long. There were individual cases, and they were promptly dealt with. The notion of the CIA as a secret government or as a rogue elephant really is not borne out by by the histories that we can now see as documents are released. The political leadership first. Harry Truman and the Truman administration, where it all got started, remember? Then Eisenhower and his administration, Kennedy, etc., etc. The political leadership has always called the tune for what the agency would do. If sometimes enthusiasts within the agency tried to, to, to get away with something, as they did, they were dealt with with relative promptness. I think Alan Dulles has to be given the credit for establishing that tradition of responsible, uh, uh, relatively competent uh, actions and mechanisms to carry out government policy. Glenn Allen, Virginia, on our line for Republicans. Good morning. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, when I went to school, there were a bunch of uh, Hungarian freedom fighters there, too. And they were promised by the CIA that they would uh, get support 
in their fight against the Soviet Union when they tried to, tried to retake Hungary. They were shooting machine guns off the roofs and things like that. Uh, obviously, it went down quite sour, and uh, they were lucky to escape with their lives. Thank you. This... Uh, 1956 episode is certainly one of the most controversial uh, and uh, troubling episodes in American intelligence history. Uh, it is not as clear-cut as uh, you just described it or indeed as Hungarian freedom fighters perceived it. Uh, the documentary evidence is clear that the United States government did not promise military or other, uh, well, military or that kind of political support to this rebellion. Um, enthusiasts in the field who were radio announcers and who were suddenly given microphones and were able to talk without discipline may indeed have given the perception that American tanks were waiting to come in, which was never true. Uh, many inquiries took place by several different governments, including the, the German government where these radio stations were, were located. These inquiries took place after the, uh, the, 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 uh, the 1956 uprising. And uh, the, although the CIA admitted lax discipline among some of its outlying uh, um, spokespeople, announcers, uh, uh, usually emigres themselves from Hungary, uh, the record is clear that uh, the CIA did not instigate or promise to uh, um, promote this uprising. This was a heroic uprising of Hungarian people themselves. Frankly, at that time, perhaps even now, the CIA does not have the competence to run that kind of show. This was a Hungarian operation of which uh, modern-day Hungary should be very proud. Inglewood, California, on our line for others. Good morning. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning. Thanks for C-SPAN. I'm curious, you, you were talking about... about how he uh, where did he get his training where where did he get his ideas for for becoming a spy you implied that he just knew it he had to have well, training who are his heroes this is a this is a really good question because um remember alan dulles younger son of a door presbyterian minister in upstate new york um a diplomat in the family tradition. His father was a minister, but his uncle was a diplomat, Secretary of State for President Wilson. The diplomatic service seemed the right thing for him to do, and he was interested in people, in, in mixing with people. That was always his, his special talent. How did he learn? There was no one to teach him. In World War I, uh, intelligence was such a primitive operation, and no one knew how to do it. Dulles picked it up. Talk about on-the-job training. There's one, uh, you know, anecdotes, incidents taught him lessons, and one of the most famous, if, if, if I can have a couple of minutes, because this is one of the most famous Al Dulles stories. There he was. A young diplomat, by this time he was in Bern, Switzerland, 1917, and he was the junior, it was Easter Sunday, he was the junior man on the staff, so when a caller, an unknown caller, called into the embassy, he was the one who had to take the call. A heavy foreign voice said, I must speak to someone at the United States Embassy right away. It was Sunday, Dulles wanted to play tennis with a girlfriend. He said, no, 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 I'm sorry, the embassy is closed, we're not available. The voice insisted, no, no, it is important that we speak. I won't try to imitate the foreign accent. And Dulles said, well, if it's so important, uh, I'll come in on Monday when the embassy will be open. And the voice said, no, no, Monday is too late. It's too late. And uh, the, Dulles hung up the phone never pursued it. On Monday, the caller, whose name was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, got on a train and went to Petrograd to begin the Bolshevik Revolution. And because of his girlfriend and his tennis game, Alan Dulles had muffed the opportunity for a face-to-face -face talk with Lenin. Uh, 
Dulles would tell this story about himself many times, especially to new recruits into the agency, with the lesson which he learned. You asked, how did he learn to do these things? He learned, always be available to people. Do not slam the door on anyone, because you never know who is going to be useful or interesting or valuable for what you are trying to achieve. That's one of the lessons. New York City on our line for Democrats. Hello, go ahead. Um, two questions. One is, uh, have you uh, read the book The Second Oldest Profession by Philip Knightley? Yes, indeed. I uh, take away from that book that the whole enterprise of spying is a complete waste of time and money because the whole system is fatally flawed in the sense that there's no way that any outsider has of telling uh, whether they're uh, getting information which is useful or not. And another example of the fatally flawed nature of the system is the fact that every time they make a mistake, they always argue because it's because they didn't have enough uh, in the way of resources. So it basically, the worse they are, the more resources they're able to garner. And um, certainly the kinds of things you've been talking about so far this morning uh, are much more along the lines of their failures than successes. So. Um, I'd like to. I'd like you to discuss a little bit about uh, why you think spying is useful at all. My second question is with regard to Kim Roosevelt's retrospective book on the uh, Mossadegh uh, overthrow in 1953 in Iran, uh, which I believe was written in the early 1980s. I've also recently read that, and it strikes me that there is a complete lack of insight in any kind of. Uh, uh, learning experience that went on in that book between the time of the overthrow in 1953 and the time the book was written several decades later. Thank you. Um, I think it is a vast overstatement to say that espionage is fatally flawed. Uh, espionage, is, uh, intelligence gathering, is not a, uh, a science, it is an art. There are mistakes made. It isn't perfect, but that is a, a, a great jump from saying it's fatally flawed. Um, it, it, the acquisition of secret intelligence uh, cannot be 100% accurate, and there will be mistakes. There are mistakes. They, they're widely known. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, it is uh, uh, not worth the effort. There have been successes. There have been American agents placed in critical positions inside the Kremlin, inside the Soviet government. United States policymakers learned a great deal about Soviet uh, military and nuclear capabilities from human agents, which they would not have known had there been no organized intelligence service. Incidentally, the, I have to tell you, the uh, a wonderful impish French, of course, intelligence chief, once uh, strongly criticized to me the notion of <coughs> intelligence as the second oldest profession. He said, it is the first oldest profession because before you can go to the place for the other thing, you have to know the address and the telephone number. Only the French could uh, come up with that analysis. As for Kim Roosevelt's views and his learning experiences, I can say, let me say two things. That spy memoirs, intelligence uh, uh, memoirs, are like other memoirs of public and private figures, notoriously selective in what they say, in how they, people remember things exactly the way they want to remember things. So, None of these memoirs can be taken as a uh, factual gospel. I do think there is a learning experience that Kim Roosevelt, however, <coughs> went through, and it, it happened very quickly. Kim Roosevelt was one of uh, Alan Dulles's leading uh, undercover operatives, and indeed, he was uh, the key uh, uh, covert agent who engineered the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. A year later, when the CIA, when Dulles and, and the Eisenhower administration wanted to overthrow Arbenz in Guatemala, half a world away, um, Dulles turned to Kim Roosevelt and said, hey, can, can you pull the same thing? And Roosevelt flatly refused, saying, Guatemala is not Iran. 
uh, the situations are completely different. You cannot run the kind of operation in Guatemala that we ran in Iran, and no, I won't do it. Turned him down flatly. Uh, so other people were given the job. So I do think we have to give some people credit, Alan Dulles on down, for learning from their experience. We are talking with Peter Gross. He is the author of several books, including Gentleman Spy, The Life of Ullent Dulles. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the head of the OSS, William Donovan. Describe the relationship between Donovan and Dulles. Uh, Donovan was Dulles' first boss, so to speak, in intelligence, in, in civilian intelligence. And it was Donovan who hired Dulles. Uh, Dulles worked for him loyally throughout the war. Um, it quickly became apparent, however, that Dulles uh, knew a great deal more about how to manage intelligence than Donovan did. Donovan knew a lot about bureaucratic politics, which Dulles wasn't very good at. Uh, Donovan knew how to maneuver, and my goodness, did he ever have to maneuver between conflicting interests in, in Washington, between military, civilian, political, uh, personnel, personality, you, you went into all that. Um, Dulles was very bad on bureaucratic infighting, but as I said before, he was such a genial figure that <clears throat> it was very hard for even his enemies in the military intelligence services to, to, to stay angry with him for very long. Um, after the war, Donovan was unceremoniously uh, ousted by Harry Truman. The OSS was abolished. And, but a few years later, when Truman realized that he'd made a mistake and that we needed an intelligence service, he turned uh, more to Dulles than he did to Donovan, uh, for one thing, Dulles was younger, and, and also he, he recognized the talent. Uh, uh, Donovan probably looked upon Alan Dulles as an ingrate, uh, and Donovan probably wanted to be the head of the new CIA. Uh, but it was not to be. So in the last years, uh, the, the mentor and protege relationship had, had frayed. Albuquerque, New Mexico, up next on our line for Republicans. Go, good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Gross. I have two questions for you. They're kind of like little tidbits, if you will. The first question is, uh, do agents uh, from separate company, uh, com companies, countries, know each other. And I, the reason I ask that question is that, of course, everything will go nameless, but I uh, have a friend that I talked to that was a foreign agent uh, overseas, and there was a Russian agent whose uh, children, child was very, very ill, and they didn't have the pharmaceuticals in Russia. And our agent, so he told me, and this is the only story I ever got out of him, he wouldn't tell me anything else, uh, our agent, actually, whose cover was in the pharmaceutical industry, got the Russian agent the medication necessary to save his child's life. So the, the, the James Bond cloak and dagger guys going around shooting each other certainly is, uh, is not that image as far as that story is concerned. And the second question is, how did you go about researching your book? Uh, to get all the information that, you know, you had to get to, to, to publish it. That's a very nice story, which I had not heard before, but it is completely believable. Um, uh, it's one of the ironies. Yes, there is kind of a comradeship among agents. Uh, not all of them, of course. Uh, agents of friendly and enemy powers sometimes do know each other. Uh, they may not know exactly who the other person is, or they certainly won't know exactly what the other person's mission is, but they share common tensions, pressures, demands, and in rare cases it might be that there would be that kind of comradeship, and I like that story very much. Researching the book of Alan Dulles and the, the, the later book on Operation Rollback, um, was a challenge because the Freedom of Information Act goes only so far when you're dealing with secret intelligence. Uh, diplomatic archives may be largely opened, but intelligence archives are very heavily uh, censored. 
in some cases, uh, in most cases, frankly, operational documents are destroyed uh, only two or three years later, not because any they might have some political significance, but just in the normal routine, they're shredded, so the, the files are not complete. Um, a lot of Alan Dulles's career was outside intelligence, and that was uh, fascinating to, to talk with members of his family and his associates. Uh, I actually, I met, <coughs> I did meet Alan Dulles. I was a schoolboy at the time, and he was the director of Central Intelligence, so it was hardly a, a, uh, uh, a fruitful interview. But um, there were plenty of other uh, people around who could share their memories of him. When it comes to the actual political and uh, intelligence operations, it was a process of triangulation. You had the memories of, of retired agents like Kim Roosevelt and other people, which were sometimes reliable, sometimes not reliable. You had memories of other people that you could match with that. You had policy documents, some of them from the State Department, more interesting from the National Security Council, from the White House itself. You could piece these things together. And uh, I made the rule with uh, that as I was researching the book that um, that I would not report any incident, any episode, which came from only one source. This is a fairly standard rule of journalists, and it should be of historians. Uh, there had to be more than one source, and frequently, uh, to my sorrow even now, there were some episodes that I just could not put in the book because I could not confirm them to that level of reliability. This is the cover of the book, Gentleman's Spy, The Life of Alan Dulles. He has also written Operation Rollback, America's Secret War Behind the Iron Curtain. Was Mr. Dulles married? Oh, yes. Uh, married, uh, married just once uh, to uh, a very gracious lady named Clover, who uh, had absolutely nothing to do with the intelligence side of his life. Uh, it has to be said, Dulles was a very convivial and uh, um, charming uh, philanderer. He also had uh, several mistresses who were known to his wife, and in at least one case, wife and mistress became closest lifelong friends. Uh, this was a, a kind of interesting Edwardian side to Alan Dulles's character. Mary Bancroft is the mistress you're talking Ma about? Mary Bancroft is one of them, and she is the one who became uh, Clover Dulles's lifelong friend. This was during World War II. Clover was in New York at home. Alan was in the field in Switzerland, and Mary Bancroft was his uh, very gung-ho, very able uh, kind of assistant who they would work together on, on running their intelligence networks, and they worked very well together. Atlanta, Georgia, on our line uh, <coughs> for others. Good morning. Go ahead, please. Atlanta, are you there? Yes, sir. Go good ahead. morning. Uh, I had my question answered about the OSS uh, earlier, but I still would like to ask, what was the principal area in, of research and in what uh, library and, and what government agencies did uh, Dr. Gross do his uh, work? I'll hang up and listen. Thank you. All over the place. Um, Dulles's own personal papers are at Princeton, uh, along with his brother, John Foster. Uh, Alan Dulles's personal papers are, are very interesting letters of a uh, uh, busy man, but absolutely nothing about intelligence. He quite properly, did not take any of his office files home. Uh, the CIA itself uh, provided uh, a significant amount of information in declassified documents and in subsequent analyses which they were which were written in-house and of course carefully classified, but they were willing to declassify them for me with all sorts of, uh, of deletions, some of which were so um, uh, silly and petty that it was easy to understand what was behind the black marks. You didn't need any great skill in, in cryptography to, to figure out what they were saying. Uh, the State Department, <coughs> as I said, the Eisenhower Library and the records of the National Security Council <coughs> were particularly valuable because, of course, <coughs> Dulles did operate at a high policy level. Um, 
interviewing people uh, who knew Dulles or who had retired from the CIA. Uh, there were a large number of sources. I, I list them in the uh, acknowledgments of, of Gentleman Spy. I, I think it goes over two pages, if I remember correctly. A large number of people were, were happy to help, uh, some of whom were willing, most of whom were willing to be named. A few still preferred not to have their names used. Um, uh, many were credible to a large extent. No one was 100% credible. They never are in, in any kind of writing of history. You don't get 100% credibility and precision. Uh, this is the role of the historian, to make judgments, to analyze, and the record is always uh, alive and ready to be corrected. Our next call, Omaha, Nebraska, on our line for Democrats. Hello, go ahead. Yes, my name's Joyce Sutton. My husband was a CIC agent during the Second World War, and I never hear it talked about much. I would like to say that I was around the young the men a number of times. They loved to talk about their, uh, when they had to write the reports to Washington. That seemed to be on their minds a lot. It was so important. But what I wanted to mention uh, about a successful operation, <clears throat> my husband was uh, stationed at Alamogordo, but... Uh, there were planes uh, being uh, brought down, crashing, during the Second World War. And they, about a week, they halted all the planes flying out of America. And he, along with uh, one of the uh, engineers uh, there on the base in Alamogordo, I believe they probably, El Paso, he, was, he went down to El Paso, discovered that there were some sticky substance on the outside of the motor and finally they 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 figured out it had to do with using either oil or gas from two different companies and that's what caused that crash so the what was interesting though and disturbing to me he was stationed then in tucson the same thing happened again why wasn't that sent out immediately to all the places it should have been sent out to mm -hmm. You, you've raised a very important point about the nature of intelligence, uh, the many levels of information and assessment of that information. CIC, of course, was a military intelligence service, counterintelligence corps. Uh, CIA and Alan Dulles was a civilian service. And um, the type of information required or, or the... the, 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 the uh, sought by different intelligence services. The type of information is very different. Uh, you mentioned that interesting example about the, the, um, uh, the, the oil on the surface of the planes. This is a, a fine example of highly technical information, uh, which is extremely important to certain people who are tasked with dealing with that kind of uh, uh, issue. But uh, frankly, not at all important to a Secretary of State or a President of the United States, except in its uh, possible implications. Uh, intelligence is very fragmented. There are certain agencies, certain bureaus uh, charged, and we have to include the FBI in this, charged with doing certain things, with observing certain things. There are other agencies, uh, Alan Dulles's agency, the CIA foremost among them, which operate on more of a policy level and uh, th their mission is to figure out what the leaders in the Kremlin are going to do. Now, uh, in caricature form, uh, or in Beijing, or in, in Tehran, or in wherever. Uh, th these are policy questions. Uh, the answers are built up from a whole range of other things, but uh, uh, that is the kind of issue that Alan Dulles would be involved in. As to why the t specific technical intelligence that you mentioned was not widely disseminated, this is known as the, the uh, static factor that so much information comes in, this was the problem at Pearl Harbor in 1941, long before, so much bitsy, fragmentary information comes in, it is a superhuman task to 
sort out wheat from chaff, to figure out how they fit together, and to uh, draw a conclusion from these little bits and pieces of information which can be meaningful to a political leadership which has to make a decision. Newark, Delaware, on our line for others. Hello, you're on with Peter Gross. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I had a question about um, uh, Alan Dulles' posting in 1945 in uh, occupied uh, Berlin and his oversight of the white list, um, the compilation of those. I'm sorry, and his oversight of what? The white list. Okay. And um, just dealing with uh, people such as Carl Blessing, who uh, initially after the war, uh, Alan Dulles helped to cultivate a uh, kind of a, a story that he was an anti-Nazi when indeed it turns out later that he was a part, uh, member of the Nazi party as early as 1937. And I'm just wondering, as, does a man like Alan Dulles towards the end of his career kind of look back on things that he may have thought at the time were right? And, it, you know, at the end of his career, he may have said, well, you know, certain people or certain things I did maybe weren't the right thing to do or the right people to deal with. Does a man like that have those kind of thoughts or does he just sure. at the time, you know, just figure that he did what he had to do and no regrets. Don't we all, don't we all uh, look back and say, gosh, if I had known then what I know now, I wouldn't have done it that way. But uh, then there are other people who, who just shrug their shoulders and say, I did the best I could at the time I did it. Harry Truman was one of those. Uh, uh, it doesn't, it, 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 there's no sense in, in, in beating your breast over mistakes that you made when you made them at the time for the best of reasons. Um, Alan Dulles's work in Germany after the war was indeed as conflicted as you described. Uh, and there were quite a few people who had been, I, I, let's say half a dozen or more, who had been Germans, who had been extremely helpful to the United States Intelligence Service uh, under the Nazi regime. Uh, a, a few of them may have been Nazi party members. Uh, what do you do with a person like this after the war? Um, technically, they had committed treason against the government of the day. Uh, it happened to be Hitler's government, and there are many people who would say, of all governments to be, to commit treason against, that's a pretty good candidate. Nonetheless, uh, they had committed treasonable acts. So, what do you do? Do you try to, uh, do you ignore them? Do you just dismiss them all, saying they're Nazis? Forget them? Do you ignore the useful services that they performed? Alan Dulles did not. He tried to help individuals, who, uh, some of whom may have been quite worthy people, others may have been crass opportunists. Uh, uh, there are no rules in this. Dulles was very conflicted about a number of these men. Uh, he was not at all conflicted about their uh, families, their wives and, and children, and he used every resource he could lay his hands on to help those people in the difficult years after the war uh, reestablish their lives. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. How many children did uh, Alan Dulles have? Alan Dulles had three children, uh, uh, two daughters and a son, uh, none of whom were in any way involved in his intelligence work. He kept his, his life very carefully compartmented. His children did not know what dad was doing. And his son, Alan, had an incident in the Korean War? Uh, his son, Alan, was a Marine in the Korean War and was, uh, was uh, hit by uh, mortar fire and suffered a very serious concussion uh, with long-lasting brain damage. How did that affect Mr. Dulles? He, he was, you know, shattered, and he, he uh, uh, what father couldn't be, and uh, uh, he, he's, uh, in his later years, he, he, uh, he and Clover, his wife, had great anguish in, in trying to find the, the right kind of medical and psychiatric treatment for young Alan, who is alive today. West Palm Beach, Florida. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, I was wondering especially about the period in 1945 in Germany 
whether Alan Dulles was aware of Eisenhower's, <clears throat> was aware and involved in Eisenhower's policy of mass murder of um, German war prisoners. It's estimated one million may have perished in our, in our camps. No, I, I think there's a little bit of a mix-up here. Uh, uh, what you might be referring to is the uh, repatriation of prisoners of war to Eastern Europe, which was agreed upon at Yalta uh, uh, as a gesture to Stalin, to the Soviet Union, that any Soviet citizens uh, who were captured and fell into Allied camps uh, at the, during and at the end of the war were to be repatriated to the Red Army from whence they came. And uh, this, in, this was where, uh, uh, although the American government did not understand it at the start, this was where these, repat the, the, these prisoners uh, were indeed executed by the communists. Uh, the American uh, officers in the field were, were horrified as they saw what was happening and they tried to stop the, the process and eventually it did stop, but too late for the many millions who were repatriated by Franklin D. Roosevelt's agreement with Joseph Stalin uh, with tragic consequences. When did Alan Dulles leave the CIA? 1961, after the, uh, the failure of the Bay of, Pig the Bay of Pig Pigs operation, when a CIA uh, force thought they could overthrow Fidel Castro, um, uh, it was a, a ghastly blunder with implications that still remain. Uh, Alan Dulles took the blame for it all, uh, though he was by no means the instigator. It was on his watch. He took the blame and was very graciously retired by President Kennedy, with whom he remained on very close personal terms. And for the next uh, uh, eight years of his life, he uh, was a public figure. He wrote extensively. He gave lectures. Um, and then, as I said, he finally uh, served as a distinguished elder statesman on the Warren Commission to investigate Kennedy's assassination. Conway, South Carolina is next. Go ahead, please. Hi. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, there are two points about the intelligence community that I never hear mentioned. One is the connection that uh, Reverend Moon of the Unification Church, who owns the Washington Times and Unite Press International, had strong intelligence backgrounds with the CIA and connections with the CIA since the 50s or 60s. And the other is that when Hansen was first reported as a Russian spy in 91 by his brother-in-law to the FBI, and then in 92... He was reported by Russia um, to President Bush. He was, they were informed that he was a spy. And yet, uh, the first President Bush decided to keep him on. Now, when you connect it to the fact that throughout the eight years of Clinton, Hansen was the FBI source that reporters like Robert Novak and other people on the right used to put in their articles some, something that it would implicate uh, that the FBI sources have told me that they are looking at this about Clinton or they're looking at like that about Janet Reno. And yet this man was here to disrupt our, our government. And, it, and then surprisingly, right before, um, right when George W. Bush takes office, he's captured and then his he he's not given the death penalty instead his wife is given his pension so it seems to me that if you connect all of these things it it just doesn't bode well for the bush family and how they control how you know what the public hears caller thank you i i don't uh i, I can't confirm or deny the accuracy of anything you've just said uh, specifically about Hansen or, or Reverend Moon or anybody else. Uh, what I can say is this, however. You're dealing in a very, in a world of ambiguity, 
with large gray areas. And information, intelligence, like Hansen was a Soviet spy, uh, that Reverend Moon worked for the CIA, the, uh, that information never comes that specifically. Uh, there are allegations that a person may be up to no good. Uh, these allegations may be true or untrue. Uh, Alan Dulles himself used to say, look, I'm dealing with useful people who, for whom I will not vouch concerning every aspect of their lives. Uh, the people I deal with are not archbishops, a rather ironic comment to be made today. Uh, he knew, Alan Dulles appreciated the moral gray areas. Uh, I can tell you this, however, that Alger Hiss, who was, as you know, uh, on uh, the center of great political controversy in the early 1950s, know that uh, President Roosevelt was himself tipped off in 1944 that this young, promising young diplomat, Alger Hiss, uh, may have been working too closely with communist representatives. And Roosevelt ignored the information. It was, it was one of the pieces of gossip. There was no proof. There was no evidence. Uh, you get allegations all the time from, from over-enthusiastic co-workers, from bureaucratic enemies, from personal enemies. Uh, it, 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 it's no good to say the information was available in such and such a day of 1919, whatever it is, why didn't we act on it? It was too obscure to be credible in many cases. And our last call this morning on this topic is from New York City on our line for Republicans. Go ahead. Yes, good morning, C-SPAN. Um, look, we're talking, my name is Brian. I'm from the Inwood section of Manhattan. We're talking about infiltrators and spies. Uh, I just want to let C-SPAN know, Brian Lamb, I hope, is listening. Uh, you have a, a screener that answers the phone. And in the last three months or so, I've called, this is my third call, the only time I got through. This screener did not ask me what my comment was, but there's a male screener that you have that asked me what my comment was the first time, and she says, thanks, we'll pass it along. It was a conservative point of view. Okay, now that we got your chance to talk to us, we're running out of, we're running out of okay. time. What's your question? My question is, uh, we know that during the 60s, the peace movement uh, was uh, infiltrated by uh, communists, by Marxists, and they basically led uh, the peace movement in the 60s. We know that during Ronald Reagan's era, that there were many uh, communist front groups that uh, stood up for uh, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. And we know that uh, people like Brian Becker, an earlier gentleman who's associated with the Communist Party USA, is also part of this so-called peace movement. And I'd like to ask your guest there, how, uh, how, uh, how serious is this, uh, these infiltrations of communists in these so-called peace movements? You know, I'll have to be quick, I understand. I would make the same reaction to your question that I did to the caricature of the CIA as being all-powerful and uh, all-capable. I think you are giving too much credit to uh, the expertise, the skill of communist infiltrators to think that they could have engineered the whole peace movement, just as people give too much credit to the CIA that they could have engineered the Hungarian Revolution or whatever. Peter Gross is the author of Gentleman Spy, The Life of Alan Dulles. He has several other books on the topic, and he's joined us in our continuing series on the history of U.S. intelligence. Mr. Gross, thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed talking with your guests. Coming up tomorrow on Washington Journal, we'll have Viet Den. He is the Assistant Attorney General of Office of Legal Policy at the Justice Department. He will be discussing victims' rights. We will be also joined in our 9 to 10 hour by Lincoln Kaplan. He's the editor and president of Legal Affairs. And David Tell, he is the opinion editor of the Weekly Standard. And they will be participating in a roundtable discussion of news for the day. Have a good day. We'll see you then.
You're watching C-SPAN, brought to you as a public service by the nation's cable television industry. Here's what's ahead, a segment from this morning.